Hi, I'm Elliot Forrest. Welcome once again to another artist check-in. Joining us today is a young artist whose work as a musician surpasses the physical confines of the concert hall by bringing classical music to millions of viewers on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube. Oboist Spencer Rubin uses a lighthearted, playful, and often hilarious approach to make classical music relatable to everyone through his short-form content. So my friend is practicing in the other room, so let's see if she catches on. Spencer Rubin, what a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, let's start at the beginning a little bit. Do you come from a family of musicians? When did music come into your life? My mom was a flutist when she was younger. Um, so music just felt like a very natural part of our household. She encouraged my brother to play cello and just hearing music of the house all the time really felt like a natural thing for me to do as well. It's funny because my dad is kind of the exact opposite of a classical musician. He's more into sports and that whole area. I started piano at age five and then I knew I wanted to play a more unique instrument for the long term. And so after listening to a bunch of orchestral recordings, I just love the tone of the oboe. So I started oboe when I was seven. Then it just kind of flourished from there. And what, what do you think it is about that sound that, that drew you into it? I think when played well, it's very speech-like and something about the sound feels natural to me. Um, it has a roundness to it, but also has the versatility of very short, perky articulations and long soaring melodies. You know, I think there'd be a real knockdown drag out if, if we ever got a bunch of people in the room together and go, okay, which one's most like the human voice? Because I know it's got, got to be the cello. It's got to be the violin. Yeah. And you'd be in there going, no, it's got to be the oboe. Yeah. Was there a moment in which you thought, this is not only something I'm enjoying, but I could, I could do this for a living? As I'm growing up, my dad constantly reminds me of the quote, um, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And that really speaks to me throughout playing and practicing so many hours, you know, when it can become a little bit monotonous and you think to yourself, oh, why am I doing this? Why am I putting in so much work? Um, but it's for those moments um, on stage in an orchestral performance where I remind myself, yes, this is why you're doing it. This is like, I really love doing this and being able to do that as a profession. I just think there's no better option. I also just can't think of anything else I'd rather do. Like, <laughs> there really just isn't. <laughs> yeah, when you talk about how much you practice, I think people are always surprised at this level. Even students, how many how many hours a day do you think you, you, you dig in and practice? I try to aim for around three of actually playing, but I would say that the remaking actually takes a, a much bigger portion of my days. For non-oboists, um, the remaking is not as important but probably more important than the actual playing itself what does that entail it goes all the way back to buying tube cane that most of us get from france we split the cane we gouge the cane we have to do all of these things to the piece of cane just to turn it into a double reed and you can put hours into a reed from all the way back to the preparation stage and one little wrong move when scraping and the whole thing can stop working and then got to make another one and just like go hey amazon send me some reads i wish i wish you could do that you know people do sell reads but there's a very personal aspect to each read and everyone wants something different from each read so through the process of making your own reads you really get to figure out what suits you the best and what feels most natural for your embouchure what feels best for your oboe that the remaking process itself I actually find way more complicated and it's almost like, you know, like ballerinas have to make their own point shoes sometimes, you know, it's, it's similar to that aspect. I would say I put more time, if not the same amount of time into remaking than I do practicing the instrument. What inspired you to start posting content online? It all started around COVID when I think a lot of people found themselves with a some extra free time and not really knowing what to do with it. I didn't have so much free time, obviously, because I was still practicing and doing all that. But I found that posting online was just another outlet for my creativity. And after a few videos got a lot of views and I saw the potential that 
this could have, then I started to think more about, you know, how can I post these videos to make an impact on the classical music community? How can I make it more accessible for people that don't know that much about classical music? And while I wouldn't say that every single video I post, I'm thinking, you know, how can I further the classical music community? How can I do this and that? But it's more of a result of the videos that I find really has a, a really big difference. So, so what have you discovered? I mean, I'm guess I'm guessing humor ha has worked for you. I feel like 99% of the population sees classical musicians as super serious and stuffy and other things like that. Um, but I would say that the comedic approach to my videos is very intentional. Um, I'm trying to prove that classical musicians are like everyone else. You know, a lot of us are really funny. Some of us are not, but, um, <laughs> I'm trying to create that human aspect of classical musicians themselves, because a lot of times the music is serious, but you know, we're also just like everyone and maybe people would feel more excited to go hear a symphony perform if they can know the musicians behind the performance. I don't know whether you were a fan of PDQ Bach or Peter Schickley, but, uh, you know, he passed away earlier this year, but there, and even Victor Borga before that, and Isabel Hagen, even now the viola player, I'm guessing, you know, who she is, uh, she's doing stand up on the tonight show as well mm -hmm. as playing. So, you know, I think this, uh, combination of classical music and, and humor runs deep and, and has a great history. Uh, but not a lot of people are doing it. So I applaud you for that. What's your process? Do you just sort of like, oh, this could be funny. Do you think it out too much? Or is it fairly spontaneous when you think of your online content? I think a lot of my videos are based on actual experiences that I've had. I think that my experiences almost reveal situations that could be more funny than how they actually are. One example that pops into my mind is, you know, tuning an orchestra at Juilliard. A lot of us are friends with each other. And so many times I I'm friendly with the concert master that's standing in front of the orchestra and I'm looking at them as they're standing up and, you know, we smile at each other. So if I could turn that into a little skit, maybe enhance what it is actually really like, maybe people would find that interesting and relate to that aspect when they're watching a performance. Were these new skills that you had to develop? I mean, at some point, you're also talking about shooting, editing, lighting. Definitely also having lessons on Zoom during COVID that really prepared me for, you know, having good natural light in front of you and making sure that the audio quality is exactly how you want it to be. But there is a different aspect to the content creation part of it. There are a lot of materials that I use just to get that little small frame on your phone, you know, three ring lights from strategic points to get the perfect lighting, a tripod here with my, sometimes a music stand in front of me with my script for the video. It's a lot of figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And I also try to look back at videos that I like the result of, and I try to copy the setup that I did for that, or thinking about what went into each video and trying to replicate what resonates with me and what does well with the audience. I often think that, uh, and maybe they do now, but that, uh, for the most part in music schools, they weren't teaching stage presence, uh, mm. speaking to the audience, uh, stage confidence, knowing that you're a performer as well as a player has making the content and being on camera, uh, had an impact in, in your personality and your, your stage presence and confidence. I actually sometimes still do get nervous a little bit when filming a video because I think to myself, millions of people could be seeing this exact moment, what's happening right now, but it definitely has helped my stage presence. It's helped my confidence. Um, I just generally feel more comfortable talking to people and being able to share what I love most with people. So I'm really grateful for not only the opportunity that posting online has given me to reach other people, but also the personal benefits that it's brought. So you, uh, and you can always change your mind. I'm just wondering, you know, are you thinking orchestra member, soloist, yeah. chamber musician, and how does the, the online content maybe play into that decision now as to which direction you go? I think my ultimate goal is to play, um, in a major orchestra that has been the jeer of mine since I've ever started playing the oboe. 
but I still definitely want to keep making classical music accessible through social media. Um, I don't think it's a one or the other. I think I just kind of use my social media to highlight what is going on in my professional life. And I think really pursuing an orchestral career would be very personally fulfilling, but also documenting what that's like for people who are just interested in classical music or interested in orchestras would be great for myself and great for everyone watching. So where are you exactly? And you're in, uh, how many years have you been at Juilliard? I'm going into my third year. So it's a lot, lot, lots of video, lots of content, lots of fun to have between now lots and then. Of, lots of fun things to keep happening, yeah. yes. Yeah. Well, uh, well, uh, thank you for doing this. It's a pleasure to meet you. It was a delight to see all the content you put online and, and bring it with a certain sense of uh, joy and fun, which uh, we at Q WQXR think is really important in classical music. So we're glad you're a part of that. Thank you very much. WQXR's artist check-ins are made possible with generous support from Rose Herschel.